know, they talk about on TV all the time, wear your mask, wear your mask. It's more so now than then, I believe, because it is bad out there. <coughs> Today's scripture reading of God's Word is Psalm 78. My people, listen to my instructions. Open your ears to what I am saying. For I will speak to you in a parable. I will teach you hidden lessons from our past stories we have heard and known, stories our ancestors handed down to us. We will not hide these truths from our children. We will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord, about his power and his mighty wonders. For he has issued his laws to Jacob. He gave his instructions to Israel. He commanded our ancestors to teach them to their children so the next generation might know them, even the children not yet born. And they, in turn, will teach their own children. So each generation should set its hope anew on God, not forgetting his glorious miracles and obeying his commands. Then they will not be like their ancestors, stubborn, rebellious, and unfaithful, refusing to give their hearts to God. So be it. Leave it. Yeah. There was a fire going on down there, but not bad. It was a little hazy on Wednesday out on the lake. No, Wednesday, I mean Saturday. Uh, and then Sunday was crystal clear. We didn't go to church. We had church on the lake, just the two of us. We're two or more gathered together, right? That's what, what um, Catherine always says. So we'll start with prayer, and then we'll get into this. I don't have a sermon today either, just by the way. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you. Lord, we do thank you that you would choose to love us. We do thank you for the grace that you give us every day, so much that we take for granted. Lord, we do pray especially for those that are being uh, forced out of their homes or even lives that are lost because of the fires and all the other tragedies that are going on in this world. Lord, may we thank you when there are tragedies. May we thank you when times are good. May we thank you when times are just okay. You are a God who is so loving and kind, and you are in complete control. And you have called us to be your ambassadors, to be your voice to this world, and not just be your voice, but be your hands and feet. And help us to remember that today as we are your church. Lord, prepare us to, to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. Renew our spirit and our mind to serve you in every circumstance. Give us the words, give us the gifts that we need, Father, to to be a blessing to one another and to the world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Walt, for taking the courage to get up here. I did call him, and I said, do you ever think about preaching? He said, yeah, I think about it sometimes. I said, what about short notice? He said, no. <laughs> and then he called me back a little later and said that he would. And I was trying to disguise all this from Sherry because I didn't even think about it until then because the only way that we're going to get out of the the workplace, not this workplace, that workplace, is to take a three-day weekend. And she didn't think we'd get out at all. And if you know anything, I've tried to be as open about things as I can be. Business has been crazy since all this started. And if you haven't noticed, my son is not here. I haven't had him at the business. And he's not here in church, and he's not there in the parsonage now, if you see that. So when you see Sherry and I over there, we are moving in there. We've got to sell our house, which we already are, had decided to do. We're running the business and we're doing church, but God doesn't give us any more than we can handle. And I've kind of got lazy and complacent. I'm gonna be honest right here at first, and I didn't plan on saying any of this, <laughs> because I've got so much going on. But like he's put on my heart in last week, 
I would love to not do Awanas this year personally. I would love to use COVID as an excuse to take some time, but one weekend was great. Thank you again, Walt, for doing that, and thank you guys for loving us so much. But we've got to minister. We've got to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ every day. The rest of this can distract us and just be noise. And I don't want to be a gong or a clanging cymbal. I want to be a voice for Jesus. And not just a voice, but I want people to see my good deeds and glorify my Father which is in heaven. So yeah, it'd be a lot easier sometimes to say, oh, we're not going to do it once, but we are. And it is one thing that this church does in ministry well. So I want you to pray about that and focus. As we get into Timothy, you see young Timothy, he's there because of the scripture that Merle read. He's there because his grandmother trained his mother, which trained him. Should have been his father in there, and I don't know why it wasn't. But thank goodness for the godly women that we have also. And these godly women that make such an impact in our Awana's ministry. But Paul is training up Timothy because Paul won't be here forever. And he's training up Timothy. He's got several co-workers, but Timothy is really his only one, his young Padawan, if you know anything from Star Wars. <laughs> He's training him up to take on his role. And he's going to the church in Ephesus, which is probably one of the better churches we see as far as realizing what their mission and their call is and not being distracted by the world. But you see that they're, they're distracted also. They're distracted because they're trying to study so much to be more knowledgeable, have more wisdom, but not apply it. They're studying the law and genealogies and everything, but they're not applying this to the world and they're getting distracted and not being the church, the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. Because he left and he said, I'm leaving you behind to do the things that I did. Not just the things that I say, but your actions speak louder than your words when you get out and do the things that Jesus does. And this church is kind of getting distracted from that. And Timothy's been around to the different churches. And now he goes to the church. And as we see, he sets up leadership and everything in the church so that the church will follow the patterns of living like Christ in this world. Today, so many churches aren't even preaching doctrine. They're preaching another gospel. Walt talked about that. So many times today, the church is inward focused instead of outward focused. We want to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. And if we're not training up our children, then there's not going to be a church. Not one right here, especially. This building will become whatever it will be. That's not God's will. That's not His plan. His plan is to raise up our children, to train them up in fear and admonition of the Lord. And that's what we're going to do. So I do have some scripture today. Just scripture. And I don't know how much of it I'm going to read. But we'll get into that. But let me think where I want to go first. Let's start with scripture first. I'm going to go to Mark first. Because we're kind of, kind of review over what we have read so far this year. First book of the New Testament we read was Mark. Then we read Acts, Hebrews, Galatians, James, Matthew, Romans, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Philemon, Luke, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, and now we're in 1st Timothy. Some of you that have been reading along, you've been as dev devote or devout, I guess it would be right, that's how you pronounce it, be, have been as devout reading this year as you ever have. And that's because iron sharpens iron. That's because we're doing one of the roles of the church. We're coming together to read and study God's Word. But why? So that we can apply it to action, to agape love, to Christian leadership, fellowship, works in this world, inside this church and outside in the world. And yes, that means individually in your workplace and so forth, but that also means as a church, the mission of the church. And when I was thinking about what missions of this church is outside this church, outside in the world, then I keep coming back to Awana, 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 Awana. Because we don't do the food banks, we don't do the other things, but we do Awana. 
And like I mentioned before, a couple weeks ago, I think I did, that any of you that have began to serve, oh, it's such a blessing. Because you're simply doing what God has called you to do. And like Walt said, when you feel the power of the Holy Spirit come upon you just because you've been willing to be His servant, oh, we were just talking this morning. He said, I don't know how you get up there and preach every week. I said, I do. That same do, dynamos. Di, di, see, I don't even know how di, say it for me because I want to say dynamite. Dunamos? Dunamos. Dunamos. I didn't want to say it wrong. That dynamite power that simply comes from God because you said, I will. I don't have any of the gifts, any of the talents, anything else, but I'm willing. And then he gives it to you. Look at the story after story after story of those that were weak whose strength was shown to be God's strength working through them. That's the church. So we read Mark. Mark was written to the Gentiles to show that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, but he is a suffering servant. I'm going to just give you a little word to go with each book that we've read put these thought processes together. Mark 1.17, Jesus says, Come follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Let me see what I got on this phone. Can't remember. Nope, that's not it yet. This phone. Does this one work? I can put it up here, though. Okay. Do you remember this? Oh, now it just went blank. I never pick cotton. Do you remember this? Oh, don't tell me that you're too young for that. Maybe Kim's too young for it. You don't remember that? Who sings that song? Roy Clark. Thank you. Do you remember this? Buck and Roy, one's a picking and one's a grinning. Hey, uh, yeah. Well, one of Roy Clark's most favorite, famous songs was I Never Pick Cotton, right? Okay, this is a disinfectant spray. We haven't passed anything around since COVID. We're going to pass something around now. <laughs> Get a piece of cotton. Pass it all around. I just disinfected it. Smell it. Okay, and smell it. It's lavender. It'll give you some peaceful feeling. Because I heard a story one time that said that I thought I was called to preach because of a message in the sky. What did it say? I don't know. What did it say? Tell me. G P C. Go pick cotton. Is it really? I didn't know that. <laughs> I watched his sermon, so I know that. Do you know that Jesus is never going to ask you about picking cotton? He don't care if your mother did or your brother did or your sister did. He told you to what in Mark 1.17? Come, follow me. And I will make you fishers of men. Now, maybe you hadn't thought about that much, but cotton time, a cotton picker. <laughs> it's harvest time. It is harvest time, guys. The fields are ripe. Pray for workers. What does Paul tell Timothy first as you're reading Timothy? First thing he does is says, get, the, so get there to the church and pray. 
Get everybody involved in prayer. And you can see that throughout Jesus' ministry. You can see it through every movement of the church that's been dynamic. You can see prayer. So you've got about a month to be praying diligently for this Awana's ministry, for how you're going to be used in it, for preparing the families, preparing the children, how we're going to make an impact in this world for Jesus with Awana's. Plus the other things. There's a suggestion box back there that you put your money in. You can put your suggestions in. Also of how we can minister more to our community. How we can be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. First to Jerusalem, Bonner's Ferry. Then to northern Idaho, Samaria. Then to the utter ends of the earth. But we've got to be a witness. We've got to be the hands and feet here. And that cotton ball is to remind you. Plus you can smell it. Hmm. <laughs> and it can remind you of the peace that you have in Jesus Christ and how you're called to show the world the peace that they can have. This is a time when there's turmoil, when people need a Savior. See, you've got to believe and you, they've got to believe that you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, not Savior. That scripture says Lord. And then you profess it with your mouth. And those that do are saved. And when you live that way, when you believe that way, you'll have that agape kind of love. The world will know it. They'll know you're Christians because of your love. And that spark will start and grow. And just like the song said, and it wasn't that song, but it was the other one. I don't remember which one it was now. You can't have embers apart. They've got to be clumped together. You can take a match and put another match to it or a candle to it and watch the flame intensity increase. God has called us together to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. Each with his own part, with his own gift, with his own functions. So you have a part. And right now, our biggest ministry, maybe our only ministry, whatever you want to say, outside of the walls of this church, is Awana. And what a time that people need Awana. And it'd be so easy to use excuses not to. I'm too busy. What if somebody gets sick? What about insurance? What about my own health? Well, let me tell you something. God is bigger. He's bigger than any excuse you can have. So the next thing that we read was the book of Acts. The church in power and in action. And you know what verse I'm going to say, Polly. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. You don't have to know all the ins and outs and buts and whys and anything else. All you need to know is, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. We read the book of the power of the Holy Spirit and we saw some key players in there of which you see Timothy coming up because Paul has taken the time to train up a disciple that will follow after Christ. Why don't we see hundreds of disciples? Why don't we? The road is narrow. The gate is small. Few find it. And they're looking for us to show them the way. So the next book we read was the book of Hebrews. I'll sum that up in one word. <laughs> Jesus. From beginning to end. What beginning? What end? It's eternal. Everything is about Jesus. The whole reason for your existence is because of Jesus. <clears throat> and in Hebrews 10, 24, we read, Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that COVID is here. Doesn't matter what's here. Doesn't matter what persecution comes along, what we think we're going to face, what, what we're scared of, what people will ridicule us for. We are called to meet together and tell people about Jesus Christ. We are called to be the hands and feet, to feed the poor, to love one another, to bear each other's burdens. 
That's what we're called to do. Verse 33 goes on to say, Sometimes we're, we were, you were exposed to public ridicule or were beaten, and sometimes you helped others who were suffering the same things. You suffered along with those who were thrown into jail, and when, you, when all you owned was taken from you, you accepted it with joy. We hadn't had that happen to us. What's our excuse then? So don't throw away this confident trust in the Lord. Remember the great reward it brings you. Things of this world don't matter. That's why we fix our eyes on Jesus. That's why we walk by faith as we're going on to read in Hebrews. Verse 39 of chapter 10 says, But we are not like those who turn away from God to their own destruction. We are the faithful ones whose souls will be saved. I was telling Bonnie Friday, I think, we've got a free Methodist sister church in Spokane that's not even met yet because of COVID and everything going along. Pray for them. They meet so, this Sunday? What's the date? Yeah. Next Sunday? Next Sunday. Next Sunday they meet for the first time. Be praying for your brothers and sisters. I can't imagine. I mean, we were disrupted. Our last Awana, just to say it, was March 11th, I think. I might not have the exact date. Where it's simply, don't come. No answer why, anything else. I mean, they knew. But we haven't had contact with them, with those children in six months. I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm ready to feed those children. I don't care about what it might cost me. Because my God is big enough. And He knows every hair on my head and not one will be harmed unless it's in His plan and His sovereign will. And then what happens? I go to glory! Right? And he says, well done, if that's what I'm doing. All these scriptures that we've read point to a church in action, loving like Christ, and nothing else models the church. <clears throat> Hebrews 12, 1 then says, Therefore, since we're such, surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses, and a lot of these were the least of these, but since we're surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, it is a life that you live, things that you do. It's not about working for an income, providing for your family. It's about telling others and showing others that Jesus Christ is Lord of your life. Let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus. We're running a race. We are competing. We will receive eternal life, but we are also workers in the harvest, and we will be held accountable, even rewarded, and I go into those details later if you want me to, for everything we've done, even every idle thought and word. It's all about Jesus and Him being Lord of your life and the world knowing it. So the author of Hebrews goes on to tell some things about the church, and I'll just highlight these a little bit as we go through, but you live at peace with everyone and work for a holy life. You look after each other. You watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up. You're thankful. You please God by worshiping Him with holy fear and awe. Hebrews 13 verse 1 says, Keep on loving each other as brothers and sisters. Show hospitality to strangers. Remember those in prison. Remember all those who are being mistreated. And don't love money. Be satisfied with what you have. Because it all comes from God in the first place and the only reason you might have it is so that you can be rich to others. He loves a cheerful giver. Verse 15 of Hebrews 13 says, Therefore let us offer through Jesus a continual sacrifice of praise to God. Giving up and dying what you have, what you think is important to bring praise and glory to God. Oh, in verse 16, and don't forget to do good and to share with those in need. Even if you don't have much, you're still called to not forget doing good and share out of your poverty even. 
for those that don't have. The next book we read was Galatians. There's problems in the church already. Imagine that. Other doctrines coming in. Because Satan wants to distract you from your mission in Christ. He wants to make the church ineffective. And if I had to sum up Galatians in a couple words, I would say that it's faith alone. It's by faith you're saved through grace. It's by faith that you live each day. It's by faith you will live an eternity with God and nothing can separate you. It's all by faith. So going back to Hebrews, are you living by faith or are you living by sight? Galatians chapter 1 verse 6 says, I am amazed how quickly you are deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and turning to a different gospel. Wow, how terrible. This church is probably not bad. This church is probably, I hate to say it, kind of normal. They don't realize the great grace, grace, grace. I'm so glad you said it. But we take for granted oxygen, clean air every single day. And then when there is a crisis, then we cry out to God. When we should be thanking Him every day for the grace that He's given us and saying, how can I be gracious back in what you've given me? Instead of worrying about things I need to do today because it just makes sense in my own wisdom. Galatians 5 says, But we who live by the Spirit eagerly want to receive by faith the righteousness God has promised us. What is important is faith expressing itself in love. You can't just have faith and not be loving to one another. You can't love God if you don't love one another. John tells us that. And that does even mean loving your enemies. Right, Merle? Right. You're not my enemy no more. <laughs> I'm your friend, right? You were running the race so well. Paul equates it to a race again. Who has held you back from following the truth? Then he goes on to write in Galatians chapter 5, So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your life. That's what you need to do, not the things of this world good, bad, or indifferent, but let the Holy Spirit guide your life. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. Well, I didn't think just working my tail off because the business was there was doing what I wanted to do. I just something I got to do. Maybe it is, maybe it ain't. Maybe I should just sell everything and then come and follow after Jesus. I'm not saying I'm going to, I'm not saying I'm not. I'm just using that as an example. But the young rich ruler walked away that way because he wasn't willing to do that that day. What are you not willing to do for the one who gave everything to save you? Verse 22 of Galatians 5, you recognize this, but the Holy Spirit produces the kind of fruit in our lives like this, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Self-control. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Let us not become conceited or provoke one another or be jealous of one another. Those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. So let's not get tired of doing what is good. Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially to those in the family of faith. We read from James next. <laughs> James is pretty simple. Don't just say it. Do it. And there's a problem already in the church because they were saying it but not doing it. Even though they were persecuted and scattered and everything for Jesus, he still has to say, I don't believe your faith because you're not showing it to me by your deeds. James is one of the most controversial books in the New Testament because of that. 
Because people want to dissect it and take, take it wrong again. And, and I like what you said about that, Walt. If it contradicts something else, it doesn't contradict something else. You are interpreting it wrong. James is simply saying, you cannot prove to me that you believe in Jesus Christ and it not rock your world, not change everything about you. I don't believe you if that's the case. You've got to be a doer, not just a hearer. James says in James chapter 2, verse 14, What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but don't show it by your actions? And then in James 5, he says, Are you, any of you suffering hardships? You should pray. Are any of you happy? You should sing praises. Are any of you sick? You should call for the elders of the church and come and pray over you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. Such a prayer offered in faith will heal the sick, and the Lord will make you well. And if you have committed any sins, you will be, you will be forgiven. Verse 16, Confess your sins to one another. Uh-oh, that's something we don't want to do in the church, isn't it? Because then we become vulnerable in everything. But if you don't do that again, you're keeping the healing from you. You're keeping the gifts that others have to comfort you from being given to you. Pray for each other. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. Now, I'm reading from NLT. So you probably remember the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. But what's availeth mean? That's King James. At least I think I did it right. And you see that. I got that picture in the bathroom at my house because there's a dad praying over his little child. And yeah, you can apply it to that. But if you don't watch it, you'll take that out of context again. What did this say? This said the church praying for one another even when you confess your sins and your downfalls, because I know that I'm a sinner saved by grace, so I'm not going to condemn you. I'm going to love you and help build you up so that together I can't walk out there and feed the hungry with one leg. I need your leg also. I need your arm also. I need your arm. That's why God has put us all together, so we can be the body of Christ, the hands and feet of this world. And prayer and bearing one another's burdens and confessing our sins is part of that. So we read Matthew, another gospel. And you say, why four gospels? Well, you've got four different accounts written from different perspectives, written at different time periods. They are consistent. They don't contradict one another. And they give us a lot of different things. Matthew, don't forget, is a tax collector saved by the grace of God. He is a Jewish outcast. And he's writing this letter so that the Jewish people believe. And he's writing to them about King Jesus and what the kingdom of Jesus looks like. And what that means is how we live as part of the kingdom. And if we live in a kingdom, which we're not familiar with again, there's a king that we pay homage to, that we do everything that He says, or we're subject to whatever penalty He wants to put on us. And don't be surprised if death isn't a penalty that a king imposes. Jesus is king. He uses the Old Testament time and time again to, to prove His point. And then in Matthew 22 you read, Teacher, what is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? Jesus replied, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. And then you have these closing verses in Matthew. Then Jesus came and told His disciples, that's if you choose to be His disciple, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Every bit of authority, everywhere. I have been given this, Jesus says. Therefore, here's what you're to do. Go and make disciples. A Timothy. Paul has one. Barnabas was his sidekick, or actually Paul was Barnabas' sidekick, if you want to get technical. 
And then he had other helpers, but Timothy was the disciple he was training up. And now he's sending Timothy to these churches to set up order in the church where they would continue this on so they would train up their children generation after generation after generation after generation. Not get hung on doctrine, but see what the law means. Because now we don't need the law to tell us what's right and wrong. It's written on our hearts. We know it. And we have the power to obey it because the Spirit is giving it to us. The power to transform us where we can get up and give a sermon. Whoever wants to give one next. Come on, smile. Okay, I got a few. <laughs> then we read Romans. It's your choice. Saving grace or God's wrath. And that's your choice, but that's also the choice for the world out there. So you've got to make up your mind... Then you've got to live the life that shows that Jesus Christ is Lord so you can go proclaim it to them because that's the eternal consequences. They're not facing smoke inhalation or being burned up by fire on this earth. They're facing eternal wrath from God. Nothing good ever because everything good is from God. Everything, even a smoky day. It's a day that we are breathing still. Once this life is over, those who are cast into hell will never, ever know anything but torment. Now, you can believe that part or not. You can read Scripture or whatever you want because there are some doctrines out there that say that there is no eternal hell because God wouldn't do that. R read your Bible. I won't go down that rabbit trail. But our duty is to tell them about salvation today. Today is the day of the Lord's favor. Romans, 6, Romans 12, you already covered, Debbie. Thank you. Verse 1. Romans 16, 17 says, I urge you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way. So we need to be careful. Ephesians. This is the church that Timothy is going to now. If I had to say one word about this letter, I would say Maturity. Because Paul is teaching this church to grow to maturity, but yet now he's having to send Timothy because there's a hiccup along the way when we're reading Timothy. And I love Ephesians 2, 8, 9, but I love 10 better. For we are God's masterpiece, created anew. What's the Greek say? Do you know right off on that one? What's the Greek say about created anew in Ephesians 2, 10? In Ephesians 2.10, uh, where it says, We are God's workmanship or masterpiece. Do you know what the Greek word for created anew is? Well, you can tell us next week so we know. Because I love how Walt tells us the Greek so we know that. That where he was talking about John and, and um, God is and was and ever will be in everything. It is neat to have that knowledge, and I love hearing it from him. I hope you guys enjoyed that too. But we are a total new creation in Jesus Christ. Nothing old, nothing bad. Everything is anew. So your life, your world has to be from Jesus' mindset, and it has to be shared here. Because it's the mindset of God. All these can'ts, won'ts, couldn'ts, shouldn'ts that you've had before, Acts 1.8 sums them all up. You have received power. And you will be obedient because Jesus Christ is your Lord, or you won't be. And you will be His witnesses, or you won't be. What good is your faith without your deeds? See all this tying together? Ephesians 5 then says, So be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but live like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. We still live in a foreign world. We are called to be ambassadors living for Christ. Philippians, we read it. Paul wrote it from jail. Don't, remember, don't forget that. And he tells the Ephesians, because they've, I mean, the Philippians because they've given him a gift, 
Don't worry about suffering. Suffering is something that Mark told us as we started out, that Jesus Christ is the suffering servant. And He's called you and I to suffer. If you don't get this, you're never going to walk on the way to maturity, and I hope you see kind of where I think I'm going with this today. Because this sermon came hard. They don't all come easy. The transition from Corinthians to Timothy was good. My laziness last week was, was good, but I didn't know where God was drawing me. So last night I just put down verses. And I kind of got upset with Sherry because I'm like, I got to go home and work on the sermon. But she was busy washing clothes. I should have said, thank you for washing my clothes. Thank you for washing my clothes, sweetheart. You're a good wife. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Suffering. Not just called to working for Jesus, but suffering for Him. We kind of tend to forget that, don't we? But as we mature, suffering should be something that we actually take joy in. Because Jesus Christ suffered for us. If we can't fathom suffering, we're never going to fathom taking up one of these and following after Jesus. We're never going to understand suffering to be raised up to this new life that a Christian has. After Philippians, we read Colossians. It was a good thing to read that next, and it's amazing how the Bible is put together because it simply says that Christ is supreme. He is sufficient. He is everything. He should be guiding every aspect of your life, empowering every aspect of your life. Your life should look like Christ. And then we read Philemon. <laughs> We're now, it's put your money where your mouth is, basically, because we've got this slave that has left and done you dirty and wrong. Am I really going to love my enemy? Because here he is put right back in my face as a fellow brother. How am I going to accept him? Because if we're all family, then I should love you like a brother or sister. problem is, is our, our sight again instead of our faith is I can't stand my brother half the time type analogy. But I should love you as a family member. I should care about your needs over my own. I shouldn't condemn you. I should love you. I should cry with you. I should comfort with you. I should accept your correction. All these things we've already seen. And then we read the Gospel of Luke, where Luke says, here's what you've been taught. Now look at the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Again, the good news of Jesus Christ, what He said and what He did. And let's take it from this perspective, instead of where Matthew says, blessed are you when... Luke says, blessed, or Matthew says, blessed are you if. Luke says, blessed are you when you do it. He makes the call personal. Either you are following after Jesus or you're not. And then we read Corinthians. This church that we want to look at that's all messed up. But the more we look at it, the more we look like we're looking in a mirror sometimes, don't we? When we really look at it, when we really realize that we do have idols and other things, we don't just read it from a, yeah, that guy's got a lot of problems point of view. When we look at it that way, we do see that the most excellent way is love. The only way is love. It's all about God's love. We are saved because of God's love. We exist because of God's love. We are called to share God's love love. And we will live forever and ever and ever in God's love. It is by far the most excellent way. And if we're just noisy, we're just noise. If we've done all these things, we could leave this world bankrupt. And there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Because many on that day will cry, Lord, Lord, and He will say, Depart from me, I did not know you. Wait a minute, we even did mighty miracles in your name. That's what they'll hear. Jesus doesn't say anything else. There's silence. 
the next thing that they'll hear is nothing other than screams of agony, possibly. We fight a spiritual battle. We have to put on God's armor. We have to stand firm with one another as those, Walt put it, the Navy SEALs or elite, what do you call it, special armed forces? I don't remember which unit you used. But the elite fighting regime. Because we're fitted with God's armor. And we can withstand anything the devil throws at us. Even COVID. Even if it was a lot worse with COVID. And I don't mean to downplay it by any means. That's not my point. Whatever it is that we're facing distracting us from living like Christ in this world, we have to fix our eyes on Jesus. Know that He's empowered us. Know that nothing's going to happen outside of His will. And so what if we give up our life to save someone else? It's worth it. The love of God is worth it. So in 1 Timothy, Paul has sent Timothy back to the church in Ephesus. In 1 Timothy 1, it says, The purpose of my instruction, in verse 5, is that all believers would be filled with love that comes from a pure heart, a clear conscience, and a genuine faith. This is where we're at and where we've read. We've got more books of the Bible to read, even Revelation, (laughs) which is basically, when you want to get down to it, means super simplifying it. The things that must happen, because then we know that we're forever with the Lord. We focus on the things that must happen first. And how are we going to deal with that? Let me answer it to you again. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus is how we're going to deal with it. Every step of the way, every day, every second, Jesus, empowered by the Holy Spirit, for you and I to live a life worthy and honorable to God, drawing mankind to Him. So is our church doing this? Are we living and breathing as Jesus Christ? Many Christians, I I read this somewhere and I was like, wow, Many Christians, parentheses around Christians, attend church simply because it's what Christians are expected to do. Wow. If that's the answer, if we got out and talked to people why they went to church, then the church is not doing its job. If you ask other people about why they attend a certain church, they'll usually these are the answers. I like the music, I like the pastor, I like the programs. I love Jesus. And I want to deny myself, take up my cross and follow after Him, and I want to tell others. I want to serve, even to the point of suffering and dying because Christ did for me. Probably you won't hear that. Something is wrong with the body of Christ. That is the reason that we go to church. So what does a church look like? What should they do? They should love one another. I said some of these things. I just put them kind of together. Serve one another. Strengthen one another. Comfort one another. Pray for one another. Bear one another's burdens. Cry with one another. Laugh with one another. Provide for one another. Forgive one another. Encourage one another. Teach one another. Correct one another. As we, as God's family, His children, all on equal ground and, and as a brother and sister of Jesus Christ, grow to maturity, working for the kingdom until we receive our inheritance, living by faith, not by sight, as foreigners in this world, being set apart and holy, drawing others into the kingdom because of the love of God that lives through us. The way of Love is the way of Jesus. It's the way of the church. From Mere Christianity, chapter 8, if Mere Christianity, if you're not familiar with it, is a C.S. Lewis book. It's a great read if you haven't ever read it. This chapter is entitled The Great Sin. This is a quotation from it. It is so easy to get muddled about. It is easy to think that the church has a lot of different objectives and goals, education, building, mission, holding services, just as it's easy to think the state has a lot of different jobs. 
military, political, economic, and whatnot. But in a way, things are much simpler than that. The state exists simply to promote and protect the ordinary happiness of human beings in this life. That's a good definition of the state. But so many times it gets so distorted from that. That's the whole purpose of government is to protect our way of life. <clears throat> a husband and wife chatting over a fire. A couple of friends having a game of darts in a pub. A man reading a book in his own room or digging in his own garden. Simple things that God has blessed us with. That is what the state is here for. And unless they're helping to increase and prolong and protect such moments, all the laws, all the parliaments, all the armies, all the courts, all the police, all the economics, etc., are simply a waste of time. In the same way, the church exists for nothing else but to draw men into Christ. Into Christ. To make them little Christ's. If they're not doing that, all the cathedrals, all the clergy, all the missions, all the sermons, even the Bible itself are simply a waste of time. God became man for no other purpose than this. To be the hands and feet of the love of God by living Jesus Christ in this world. As a bride preparing itself for, the wedding, for their wedding day, how is this church preparing ourselves for the meeting of Jesus? That day gets closer and closer every day. Next week you'll finish 1 Timothy and start 2 Timothy. <clears throat> and you'll wrap up Friday's reading, ironically, I'll put that in quotation marks again, with a verse from 2 Timothy chapter 2. Who knows what that verse is? What is it? Study to show thyself approved. A workman needeth not to be ashamed, rightly handling or dividing the word of truth. Which happens to be the Awanas theme verse. Man, that's coming up next week. Our God is so big. So as you read next week's reading, I'm going to say again, Think of how God is wanting to use this church. Put your suggestions up there. Come to me. But I know one way is Awana. So be thinking about how God will use you in Awana. Be praying for this ministry. Be praying for these children. Be praying for the dynamics because we've never faced a, a year like this. We've got children that haven't finished their books and things. What do you do with them? How do you promote getting them to read those Bible verses and things they didn't? There's a lot of dynamics here to figure out, but really the only dynamic is Jesus. So wherever we pick up, we want to teach them Jesus. We want to live like Jesus. Father in heaven, we thank you for Jesus. Oh, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that he was willing, even though he was equal, to give up everything to save us even his life. Father, let us praise you and thank you for everything that you've given us, even the breath of life. And Lord, help us not to love anything, even life, more than we love Jesus. Lord, let it be known to the world by the way we live, by the things we say, by the things we do, by the unity of this body, by us having the same mindset as Jesus Christ and by showing it to the world. Father, be with our Awanas program. Be with each and every one of the people that are here today, those that aren't here. Be with their families and everything that's going on in their lives. Bring them the peace that surpasses all understanding that comes from Jesus. We just give you glory and honor and praise, and we thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen.